Good morning, church. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm Pastor Vern. It's good to have you online if you're joining us there. Uh, last weekend, we were away in L.A. visiting our son and uh, with a, as a family, have family vacation, and it was nice to be in L.A. It was sunny there, kind of like it is here today, but I missed you, and I really, I mean that from my heart. I miss being with my church family on the weekend. This is a good congregation to be a part of, and it's just nice to, to be back with you. Well, um, Deb and I are not pregnant. Okay, so, which is a very good thing. Um, but for Christmas, uh, uh, Deb, Deb um, she had something on her mind that she wanted as a Christmas present, and so she dropped little hints. Uh, she told me I want an Instapot. That was the little hint. I got it, okay, I, I, I picked that up. Uh, and so I got her an Instapot for, for Christmas. Uh, last night I called it a slow cooker or something and I was it totally messed up what I'm about to say because here's the thing when we got the Instapot if you're familiar with them they put things under a lot of pressure right which is what the series is about it's about being under pressure and thinking about the series and pressure I was thinking about when Devin first started using the Instapot we you know she's figuring it out and, and all of that well we like to make oatmeal in the Instapot well, something went awry with the release of the pressure. Uh, and, uh, and so all, all of a sudden one morning there's oatmeal flying all over our kitchen, just like, like a geyser, just whoosh, all over cupboards and counters and floors. It just went whoosh, all over because somehow the pressure didn't get released correctly. And here's the thing about that. That's very much true of us as human beings too. If we don't find healthy ways, and I believe God-directed ways, to release the pressure that we are under, and we all are under pressure of one kind or another on a regular basis. Sometimes that pressure comes from outside, you know, it's people's expectations of us, it's a, it's a job that's very demanding, it, you know, it might, be, though it might be financial pressure. Sometimes the pressure is, is within us, what we expect of ourselves or, or the ways we're struggling internally, and a lot of times the pressure has to do with relationships and what's working or not working in relationships, but we experience that kind of pressure, and if we don't deal with it in a way that God has directed us to, it can spew out, right? It can create all kinds of problems. Sigmund Freud, you know, as a social worker, studied some Freud. A um, lot of things he said I don't agree with, but one thing that, one thing that he said that I, always stuck with me, he talked about stress or pressure being kind of like the smoke going up a chimney. You can stop up the top of that chimney. You can, you can plug it up, but that smoke is going to find a way out somewhere. It's going to find the cracks in the chimney. It's going to come out somewhere. It has to. And that's true for us, too. Pressure is going to come out of us somehow. It's going, to get, it's going to get revealed in some fashion. might go to your heart, right? You might find yourself having some chest pains one morning, and, and it's because of the pressure that you've been under, and you haven't been dealing with that well, and it's starting to, to sit right there. It might go to your stomach, right? And you start to feel those stomach pains, and, and uh, maybe, hopefully not, but maybe an ulcer someday. It might go, um, it might go to, your, to your brain, right? And cause you to make decisions and, and think about things in ways that aren't healthy and, and cause you to make decisions that end up causing you more trouble and more pain. It might come to your relationships, right, where you take the pressure that you're feeling in one place out on other people who aren't even a part of that. Pressure is going to come out, is the point. We have to know what to do with it, and that's what this whole series is about. So last week, Pastor John talked about conflict, one of the sources of pressure we experience, and he talked about dealing with conflict, you know, quickly and personally and, and, and gently and those kinds of things. Great message. If you haven't seen it, it's on our website, uh, Facebook page you can go there and you can find it. We're going to be talking about more about stress in this series. We're going to talk about this pressure that comes from having gone through trauma or experiencing trauma in your life. But today we're going to talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Because forgiveness is, I think, one of God's gifts to us for dealing with the pressure that we face in life if we will utilize this gift of forgiveness. And it's really in two directions. It's, it's the forgiveness that we need to ask for, 
okay? And it's the forgiveness that we need to extend. And both of those are the ways that God has invited us to release some of this, especially relational pressure um, that we experience in life by asking for forgiveness and by extending forgiveness. You know, some of the most powerful words in our vocabulary are the shortest words, and they're also the most difficult words to say for a lot of people, right? Things like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Things like, please forgive me. Things like, I was wrong. Things like, I do forgive you. Some of the shortest words, shortest sentences, you know, the simplest words, we all know them. But we struggle so much to say them sometimes. And yet God has given us this vocabulary to release the pressure that we feel in this life. So that's what we're going to talk about. My main point today is very simple. Um, because we are imperfect people, we need to practice forgiveness. Any imperfect people here besides me? I mean, I'm part of the imperfect people club. Anybody else? Okay, all right. Are you imperfect? Turn to, your, turn to somebody and say, I'm an imperfect person. Go ahead, it'll be good for you. Do it. Go ahead, do that. Okay, and, and now turn to them and say, so are you. And that feels better, doesn't it? <laughs> All right. Um, we are imperfect people, and life is, is hard. Life is challenging. And, you know, when I talk about forgiveness, and, and this is a challenge because, you know, some of the things that, that people have to be forgiven for are, or, or we have to extend forgiveness for are so huge. They're so huge. I'm, I'm working on this message and yesterday, and, and I got done, and, and uh, I was feeling pretty good about it, and then I, I uh, went onto my news feed, and I'm reading about some of the atrocities happening in Ukraine. And I thought to myself, how... How do you tell people who are experiencing those atrocities, you know what, you're gonna need, at some point, you're gonna need to come to a place where you can forgive the people who are committing those atrocities against you. How do you say that to people, right? That's hard, right? People go through so much, and some of the things you've gone through, people in our church have gone through, you know, when I talk to you about, you know, needing to extend forgiveness, it's like, I could never do that. I don't know how I could do that. I could never forgive that person for what they did. And yet God says he makes it very clear. This is not, this is not uh, optional for us as followers of Jesus Christ that we need to love our enemies and we need to extend forgiveness, okay? And, and part of the reason we struggle to do that is because of pride, let's be honest, right? It's hard to go to people and say, I was wrong. It's hard to extend forgiveness. I'll never tell them I forgive them. I won't, I won't humble myself that way, right? That can be difficult. But another reason is because we don't always understand what forgiveness really means. You know, we think forgiveness means letting people off the hook or forgetting about what happened or minimizing that thing, and that's not at all true. Okay, none of those things are true. Forgiveness, well, I'll, I'll give you a, a, a definition of forgiveness in a little bit, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to share a uh, scripture with you uh, from near the back of the Bible. We're going to read an entire book. It's, it's the book of Philemon. It's not very long, so um, don't get nervous, all right? If you want to follow along, it's up here on the screen. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, 
but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. What's going on here? Well, uh, this is a very personal letter that Paul writes to his friend Philemon. Uh, Philemon is a man Paul knew personally. He had brought Philemon to faith in Christ at some previous time. But now Paul is in jail in Rome, 1,300 miles away from where Philemon is in Colossae. And by God's providence, an amazing thing has happened. Philemon had a slave. And we could get into a lot of discussion about slavery, and, and slavery is wrong, and, and I think it's, it's uh, good for us to remember that Christians were responsible for bringing about the end of slavery in the modern era, in the 17 and 1800s. Um, but slavery was a reality in this culture. It was very different from slavery in, that we experienced in the United States, but it was still slavery, an indentured servanthood kind of thing. And Onesimus is a slave in Philemon's home. Probably a third of the population served as slaves in somebody's home. They also served as doctors and teachers and, and other uh, servants. So um, it, was, it was very different. But still, Onesimus is a slave in, in Philemon's home. He runs away. We don't know why. Uh, I'm going to assume that he's not being mistreated because Philemon is a Christian. And he's holding a church in his home. He, and, he, and Paul talks about him refreshing the hearts of others. So I'm going to assume that, 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 Ones, uh, that Philemon was treating Onesimus well. Um, we don't know that for sure, but I'm going to assume that. But in any event, Onesimus steals from Philemon, his master, and he runs away. And he makes his way somehow to Rome, 1,300 miles away, where, again, somehow he's put into contact with the Apostle Paul, who happens to know his master, Philemon, back in Colossae. And Paul brings Onesimus, the slave, the runaway slave, to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Onesimus, therefore, becomes a changed person. He's a new man. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. He's not, and Paul writes to uh, Philemon, and he says he's no, really, not really a slave any longer. Now he's your brother in Christ. So Onesimus has changed, but Onesimus has a need, and that is to confront the person that he stole from and to get forgiveness. See, Paul will not let him just avoid that. Paul would like to keep him with him, but he won't let him avoid the need he has to go back to the person he stole from and seek his forgiveness. And in this, Paul is carrying out what, what Christ has told us to do, which is to be ministers of reconciliation. Paul writes about that in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. He says, we have been given, Christians, a ministry of reconciliation. We're to be the peacemakers that Jesus called us to be. In other words, where we have opportunity, and we see people who are not getting along, who, who need to confront one another for forgiveness, both to receive it and extend it, then we have a responsibility, if we have relationship with them, to do our part where we can to help bring that about. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. Nobody knew more about forgiveness than Paul. He was a murderer of Christians, right? He was trying to stop Christianity in its tracks. And God spoke to him. Jesus appeared to him, brought him to a saving faith. Paul knew he was a horrible sinner. He even struggled with sin, Romans 7, after he became a saved Christian. He knew what it meant to be forgiven. And he knew that he needed to try to increase the, the forgiveness or make forgiveness happen between uh, Philemon and Onesimus. So Paul sends Onesimus back to Colossae, back to Philemon. I wonder what Onesimus was feeling on that trip back. Understand that, that slaves in that culture who had run away could be executed. 
So he's going back to face his master, and maybe that's rolling around in the back of his mind. But he goes back with this letter from Paul, and he gives it to Philemon. And Paul is counting on the fact that Philemon is a Christian, and Philemon is going to do what Christ would want him to do, which is to extend forgiveness to Onesimus. Paul's counting on that. He's hoping for that. You know the hard thing? <laughs> I want to know the end of the story, <laughs> which we won't know until we get to heaven and hear about it. But three essential people in this story, right? There's Onesimus, who's in need of forgiveness. There's Paul, who's trying to bring it about. And there's Philemon, who has the opportunity to extend it. Well, what is forgiveness? Let me, let me give you uh, this from Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul says, uh, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Now, that's not a definition of forgiveness, but I think if you look at the contrast between what he says in the beginning and then when he, uh, he, he, what he says in the second sentence, you can see what he's talking about when he talks about forgiveness. It's getting rid of the bitterness, rage, and anger that we feel towards the people who have hurt us. This is what, what it means for me to forgive somebody who hurts me. It means I don't want to hold on to bitterness. I don't want to hold on to rage or anger. Uh, I, don't want to, I don't want to seek revenge. I don't want to hurt them. That's what it means to forgive. The contrast with forgiveness is, is kindness and compassion. Uh, compassion. And I, and I read that, and again, I think about these people in Ukraine and, and others who've experienced horrible tragedies and, and trauma at the hands of somebody, and I think telling them you need to come to a place where you can love that person might seem like a canyon way too big to cross. Could never get there. Forgiveness often requires that we take steps, right? We move by steps. And, and I think one of the steps that, that will help us to get to the place where we might even be able to entertain the thought of loving a person who has hurt us so badly is to at least begin with this. Can we acknowledge that person needs the love of Christ? Can we acknowledge that that person needs to come to a place of repentance and know the forgiveness of Jesus for what they have done? and have the love of Jesus poured into their hearts. Maybe I can't see myself loving them just yet, but can I pray that they will come to know the love of Jesus? It's hard, forgiveness is hard. I was reading about uh, Renee Napier, um, and I found this story because uh, I came across a song called Forgiveness written by Matthew West, a Christian artist. And uh, he wrote the song Forgiveness based on Renee what, uh, Napier's experience. Renee Napier uh, was a mother of a beautiful young girl uh, who was killed along with her friend in a car accident because of a drunk driver named Eric. And Renee came to the point where she was able to forgive Eric for killing her daughter and her daughter's friend. Eric came to the place where he received Renee's forgiveness. And after a period of time in prison, I think he spent 10 or 11 years in prison, um, he and Renee, the mom, uh, began to talk with groups about drunk driving and the effects of that and forgiveness and all those kinds of things. And I read that story and I think, what kind of strength and courage did it take for Renee Napier to forgive this man? How did she get there? This man who took the life of your daughter in a senseless accident. But she did get there. She got there with the love of Jesus in her. And Matthew West wrote a song about it. Let me share a couple of the lyrics with you. He says, It's the hardest thing to give away and the last thing on your mind today. It always goes to those who don't deserve. It's the opposite of how you feel when the pain they caused is just too real. It takes everything you have to say the word forgiveness. It flies in the face of all your pride. It moves away the mad inside. It's always anger's own worst enemy. Even when the jury and the judge say you've got a right to hold a grudge, it's the whisper in your ear saying, set it free. Forgiveness. It takes a lot of courage, a lot of strength, a lot of Christ to forgive like that. 
There's a lot more that I'd like to say about forgiveness today, and, and uh, we would be here quite long. Uh, this is a big topic. The whole Bible is about this, right? From the moment Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and violated their relationship with a loving God, and God forgave them for that, right? All the way through the Bible. This is our story. It's the story of God forgiving people like us who are sinners, who are rebellious, who run away from him like Onesimus did, right? Who turn away, we steal from God, and we take all of his blessings and we run from him. And, and then God continues to pour his love out on us. And if we receive that grace and love, we're forgiven for it. Because we're such good people in the end. And you better say, wait, no, <laughs> because that's not it at all, is it? Why are we forgiven? Because God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross to pay for all of our sins. Just like Paul offers to Philemon, he says, if, if, if Onesimus stole from you whatever he took, charge it to me. I'll take it. I'll pay for it. And that's exactly what God did for us. He paid for our sin so that we could be forgiven and our relationship restored. Isn't it beautiful? Amen? It is. It's beautiful. And what does God ask of us? Pay it forward. Pay it forward. Let me close. Troy, we're going to jump to that last slide. In Acts chapter 7, um, we, re we, we learn the story of the first martyr for Christ, the first person to die after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. There's a young man named Stephen who loved Jesus, and he began to speak about Jesus. And the people listening got so angry listening to him talk about this Jesus that they picked up stones and they began throwing them at him, one after another, with every intention and ultimately succeeding in killing him. But as they're throwing these stones at Stephen, this is what we read in Acts 7. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knows he's going to die. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Can I be very transparent with you? I don't know if I was being stoned to death if I would be able to say that. But I am so humbled by the fact that Stephen did. He's following Jesus. He's following Jesus, who from the cross said, Lord, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. You see? He's asking forgiveness for the people who are killing him. Wow. And I struggle to forgive the person who said an unkind thing to me. <laughs> Forgiveness. You want to release the pressure from your life? Is there anybody you need to go to and say, please forgive me, I was wrong, and I'm sorry? Do it. Is there somebody you need to go to and say, I've been carrying bitterness and anger towards you for a long time, but I want you to know I release you. I release you from that. I forgive you. Are there two people you're close to and, and they're just at odds with each other and you know because God has been telling you, say something. Might work, might not. Right? We don't know what happened to Philemon and Onesimus. We just know Paul knew. I have to take this ministry of reconciliation into the world. I have to do my part to try to bring more peace between people. This is how we're going to get free of the pressure. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks ah, for people like Stephen. Lord, unbelievable. Unbelievable. And yet it's exactly what you did for us. You gave your life for our salvation. You, you, you paid the sins of people like us. And you did that out of love. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us to be able to do the same for others. 
Lord, remove the bitterness and the anger from us and, and fill us with more of your love. And give us the courage to ask for forgiveness, the courage to give forgiveness, the courage to be free. We leave the results in your hands. We just pray that you will, be, that you will make us more and more like your son, Jesus. The world needs more people like Jesus. So help us to be those people. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm, I'm singing that song and I'm thinking about how hard it is for, for in some cases, to, to think about forgiving somebody who's caused a lot of pain. And I'm thinking, he'll make a way. He will make a way. We need to trust him. We need to follow him. But I also want to say this. I know, you know, forgiveness for some of you, I, you think about somebody or something and it's just, you can't imagine I want you to know your pastoral staff is here and we would be more than happy to talk with you and, and, and hear your story and, and, and try to help as best we can. So just let us know if there's something that we can do. Also, if you have questions about forgiveness, because I only cover part of, a real part, small part of what I had to say today, would like to say, email me or email John. You can get us or Marsha at first name. For me, it's Vern at NorthgateFMC.com. You got a question, you want to talk about something, let us know. Third thing is I put out a top 10 every Thursday or just about every Thursday. And, uh, and this Thursday, I'm going to put in some of what I didn't have time to share today about forgiveness. So if you get the top 10, it'll be there. If you want to get the top 10, uh, again, Vern at NorthgateFMC.com. Let me know. I'll get you on the mailing list. The, the takeaway is this. Jesus, <laughs> he doesn't leave us a lot of wiggle room. He says, when you pray, pray this. Forgive us our sins, Lord, as for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Ooh, Jesus, did you have to put everyone in there? Couldn't you put in like the people we like, we'll forgive them or, you know. No, I, I want you to work on forgiving everyone who sins against you. But see, he wants us to be free of bitterness, rage, and anger. Let it go. This is forgiveness. May God give us the strength and the grace to do as he tells us. Go in the love of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.